Hi everybody, my name is Ruth Beecher. I'm a historian at Birkbeck at the University of London and I'm a member of the Sexual Harms and Medical Encounters team. I'm really pleased to be here today and to be asked to speak and I hope that everyone is well and that we get to see each other face to face one day very soon. My talk today is about child sexual abuse. It's a, it's a sensitive subject, it's a distressing issue um, there is a link on our website um, if you need advice and support and if you want to step away from the video anytime or indeed not watch it at all that is absolutely fine too. Um, I want to start my talk today um, a few years ago. In 2016 the Nursing Times publicised a guidance that had been published by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK and it highlighted the responsibility of school nurses and other members of the nursing profession to immediately inform their organisation's safeguarding lead when a young person's or a child's behaviour displayed um, it was sexualized and was not appropriate for their age. So the, the article described um, particular signs of problems um, and you can see those on the slide. But it ended with a warning from John Brown from the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And he said that children and young people should not be treated as mini sex offenders. So my aim today is to bring some historical context to a situation where nurses have to be cautioned against treating children and young people as mini sex offenders and to find out what the increasing attention to harmful sexual behaviour over the last three or four decades tells us not only about the relationship of medical and psychiatric um, attitudes to children and the surveillance of children and families, but also how those relationships intersect with gender, with ability and disability and with class. Historians have of course written about changing terminology. Lucy de Lapp found a range of terms used in Britain in the early 20th century, for example, molesting, tampering, flashing, fondling and ill usage. Um, Carol Smart, sociologist, noted that it could be called unlawful carnal knowledge, incest, criminal assault, indecent assault, an outrage, an unnatural act, a slip and so on. In fact, as Smart pointed out, it wasn't until the 1970s that the thing that we now call child sexual abuse was fully constituted as a behaviour. Now, since that time, there has been recognition that this sort of behaviour was not only inflicted on children, but could also be inflicted by children themselves. When the 1980s um, waves of awareness of sexual abuse hit medics and psychiatrists, the fact that a significant proportion of these um, incidents, assaults, were carried out by children and young people was known. But it has not been much discussed amongst uh, children's health practitioners until recently. It can be argued that looking away from children's harmful sexual behaviour is part of a wider tendency for the public and practitioners to look away from child sexual abuse. But it has also to do with the fear of child sexuality. Stephen Angelides pointed to this in 2019. He wrote that when the boundaries between childhood innocence or innocent eroticism and adult sexuality are blurred or overlap, or when adult sexuality or sexual frameworks are thought to be prematurely imposed on children, usually grave concerns and anxieties about their well-being are voiced. And the frequent changes in language, um, the designations um, used to describe children and young people, who molested other minors give a sense of the discomfort of the medics assessing, treating and researching them. I won't read you out the list but you can see it here on this slide and as you can see from the 1990s the emphasis shifted from categorising the aberrant child to categorising a deviant set of behaviours. 
So we can see too a growing discomfort with the idea of labelling and criminalising the developing child and young person. Today, I really only have time to talk about one aspect of this and I want to uh, examine why health practitioners in 2016 have to be urged to cast aside the trope of the mini sex offender. And what I want to suggest is that that this is because of the major influence of American health practitioners on the consciousness of their UK counterparts in relation to child abuse and specifically children's harmful sexual behaviour from the 1980s. And as I have limited time, I'm going to talk mostly about sexual assaults by young male family members, usually brothers or cousins, on girls and young women, and a little bit about male adult sex offenders. This is not to underestimate the impact of sexual abuse on boys, which we're learning much more about, or to ignore that a very small minority of adult women also sexually abuse children. Since so much attention has been paid to labelling these children and their behaviours, who are they and how can we find out more about their interactions with medics, with psychologists or psychiatrists? Although we've had some rigorous scholarship in the US by uh, Stephen Robertson and Linda Gordon and in the UK by Louise Jackson, as far as I'm aware, there is little specific historiography about these particular children. For a historian, there are challenges with sources. For example, children's medical or social work records are sealed for a century in the UK. We do have relevant material in trade and academic journals, training materials and that sort of grey literature within primary sources. But these child subjects are hard to locate within this material. Their sexualized behaviour shelters behind stereotypes of boys' youthful aggression. They are concealed within categories in documentary sources. So they are the brothers who abuse their sisters, the adolescents mentioned in passing, in uh, writings about adult sex, sex offenders. They appear fleetingly in accounts of victimhood, of young people with intellectual disabilities, and of young people who are criminalized or institutionalized or imprisoned. Today, I will delve into some of these fragmentary sources to talk about the medical and psychiatric personnel who in the 1970s began to think in earnest about these children and young people who assaulted others. Researchers and practitioners downplayed the sexual um, offences of adolescent boys, describing their behaviour as innocent sex play or experimentation until the late 1970s. It's difficult to find survivor testimonies to support that interpretation, although you will hear arguments from sceptics that those who are not physically or psychologically damaged by abuse are unlikely to come forward. Survivors have spoken out, however, about repeated sexual assaults and rapes by brothers, cousins and other minors. So a young woman uh, wrote to a National UK Commission on Child Abuse about her, cousin, uh, her cousin's sexual violence. Her abuse happened in the 1970s, starting when she was about five, and she wrote in her letter, He threatened to kill me if I told anybody, told me that nobody would believe me, told me that if I thought what he was already doing to me hurt, that he would hurt me even more. The abuse con um, co continued in secret for three years until when she was eight years old, her cousin raped her in her new Wendy house. And this was the act of sexual violence, which she later felt pushed her to tell someone. For, she said, it was my most treasured present and he had made it dirty for me forever. The detail provided by this survivor makes it difficult to dismiss her cousin's behaviour as, quote, a juvenile escapade or due to the normal aggressiveness of sexually maturing males. However, serious harmful abuse was classified in that way. How were practitioners making sense of adolescents sexually assaulting young children? One of the first attempts to synthesise what was known to date about child sexual abuse within the family happened in the mid-1970s in Los Angeles. 
Clinical psychologist Karen Meiselman reviewed 60 incest cases, the vast majority with female victims, in a psychiatric clinic and interviewed the therapists involved. Surprised to find a low proportion of brother-sister incest in her sample, Meiselman made sense of this by concluding that since brother-sister incest is less intensely taboo, it is associated with less psychological disturbance and is therefore less likely to be discovered in a psychotherapeutic research setting. She was not convinced that brother-sister incest caused any great harm to the sister. She used words like advances, affair and tentative in her descriptions, words that suggest a romantic union between consenting partners with equal power rather than a, an abusive incident or series of assaults. She believed that the responses or effects of the incest on three of the sisters in her small cohort indicated that they were more likely than daughters to experience conscious sexual pleasure in these events especially if they were close in age to the brother. In this circumstance, she concluded, incestuous activity evolved naturally from their mutual curiosity and playful interactions. Although two sisters in the cohort described the incest as, as a rape, Meiselman reported that one of these women seemed so blasé about it that her therapist doubted that serious violence or threat had occurred. More usually, Meiselman thought, the brother seemed to have persuaded his sister to cooperate with some combination of bribes and threats, not unlike the ones that most siblings use in their power struggles with each other. Meiselman's book was a very useful and wi widely read source to health and child welfare professionals, in including in the UK. In 1981, UK author Jean Renoir travelled to the United States to gather the most up-to-date information she could find about incest. She met some of the key players in terms of clinicians and researchers, including Karen Meiselman. Although largely forgotten today, Renvoys had published fiction before developing an interest in child abuse and um, she was an early member of the British Association for the Prevention and Study of Child Abuse and Neglect along, alongside Vanguard UK psychiatrists and paediatricians. The book she was researching in America would become Incest, A Family Pattern and it followed Meiselman very closely in its claims. For example, she stated... Sisters are more likely to enjoy the incestuous sex than daughters, presumably because they are far more likely to initiate the activity or to want to satisfy a curiosity than daughters. In thinking about the impact of brother-sister incest, she explained that, Meiselman told me that, although there is usually some difficulty with adult sex relationships, this is not usually as severe as with victims of father-daughter incest. Meiselman's actual study included only eight women who had experienced brother-sister incest and the prior research she cited also had very small samples or uh, isolated case studies. Renvoise's final judgment on brother-sister incest reeked of class bias. She concluded, I think in today's freer climate where any manifestation of sex is no longer automatically frowned upon, a certain amount of exploration among children in well-balanced families will in most cases be perfectly safe. In disturbed families, in promiscuous chaotic families, the dangers are obvious. Although her book was comprised almost entirely of the American experience, topped up with a strong dose of British class prejudice, it was widely reviewed across medical, sociological and criminal justice journals. Not only were publications by US medics and, and mental health practitioners circulating widely amongst their British counterparts, but those books written in Britain at that time, for the most part, chronicled the US journey and experience. While Meiselman's conclusions had been based on a psychotherapy clientele at a private practice, clinical psychologists working in very different settings were also beginning to consider adolescent sexual behaviour. Nicholas Groth was, in 1979, director of an adult sex offender programme funded by Connecticut's Department of Corrections at Summers, Connecticut. 
he noticed that a fifth of the adult offenders he was working with had a criminal history of juvenile sexual assault and a larger number divulged that they had committed um, similar assaults in their early teens, but they hadn't been apprehended. At a 1983 conference on child sexual abuse in New Haven, he explained to an audience of school nurses, social workers and teachers that 82% of sex offenders in the correctional institution had been victims of such sexual abuse in childhood. And he claimed most turned from victim to offender when they reached adolescence. The New York Times reported growth as saying that adolescents were a very necessary target group because most of these men do not start becoming offenders as grown-ups, they start as teenagers. Many other similar claims were made by psychologists working with adult offenders who, who argued strongly um, that their research findings suggested the need to intervene with young people with concerning sexual behaviour. These ideas too were briskly dispatched to Britain. And just as Wren Voys had imported Meiselman's views on brother-sister incest to the UK, others would bring what Nigel Parton has described as the notion of the adolescent as an incipient adult sex offender. In 1987, for example, Anne Fillmore, a therapist who had worked at a treatment centre in Portland, Oregon, penned a two-page awareness-raising feature called Treatment of the Juvenile Sex Offender in the UK journal Health Visitor. Here are some health visitors from the 1980s. In her article, she stated categorically that juvenile sex offenders will grow up to be adult sex offenders unless they are detected and given treatment. Fillmore provided a long list of characteristics of these young people. Her language is now outdated and unacceptable and disrespectful by 1980s standards too, but I am repeating it here to show you the picture she was building of the juvenile sex offender. Learning disabled, mentally retarded, an FLK, which in our parlance means a funny looking kid, dysmorphic, overweight, hyperactive. Her comments reflected broader myths about people with intellectual disabilities, including the perception that left unchecked, their sexuality would become rampant and lead to sex offending. In another part of her article, she notes, the only single underlying factor in all juvenile sex offenders is their total lack of empathy for their victims. Her language throughout suggests that these young people were dangerous predators. This journal went to every registered health visitor and many school nurses in the UK, so it had the potential to influence a wide, a wide swathe of practitioners who worked in the community and their attitudes to young people. Back in the United States, paediatricians were expressing concern about an even younger range of children. For example, Hendrika B. Cantwell, a paediatrician working alongside Denver Social Services, reported that their sexual abuse team was by 1985 identifying three to four cases of um, children, child perpetrators below the age of 10. Cantwell worried that these might contribute to a potential reservoir of adolescent and adult perpetrators. She demanded careful surveillance by children's caretakers um, of sexual play to ascertain whether it was abusive and potentially transmissible to other children. These ideas, the reservoir of perpetrators spreading sexual behaviours like a contagion, an infectious agent from one child to another, call up older notions about sexually deviant children and how they might affect or infect others, especially in group settings. While paediatricians tried to work out what was normal child sexual activity and what was dangerous and might be contaminating, treatment programmes in the US rapidly expanded from 22 in 1982 to 500 only five years later. These were based on models developed for the treatment of adult sex offenders. And I wish I had time to talk about the ethics of the use of aversive conditioning on children and young people. But alas, today I can't, I don't. But as psychologist Frank Di Capaldi has pointed out, in the United States, adolescents involved in sexual misconduct were, by the early 2000s, perceived as requiring 
exclusionary legal and mental health treatment, confinement, assessment, intervention, community surveillance, and seen as budding sexual menaces in need of careful surveillance and control. Now, context, pol politics and circumstances are dif different in the United Kingdom and responses to harmful sexual behaviour have not unfolded in an identical fashion. The influential research of growth and others that worked backwards from adult sex offenders in custody to all children and young people as potential sex offenders has been discredited. But the fact that the NSPCC had to issue a warning to UK nurses that children should not be treated like mini sex offenders suggests the per pervasive influence of US medicine and psychiatry and an immensely profitable treatment sector on practitioners thinking about these children and young people. When I read the Nursing Times article on the harmful sexual behaviour guidance, I found it curious that its author omitted the very next sentence of the clinical guidance. Immediately inform your organisation's name safeguarding lead when a child or young person displays sexualised behaviour that is always inappropriate, regardless of age, such as public masturbation. Anyone who's worked um, as a community nurse, as a health visitor or in a health centre or nursery or observed children in any real world setting will know that children, young children, often go through a stage of exploring their genitals or touching them for comfort. Compulsive masturbation is one of the alerting signs for sexual abuse and harmful behaviour rather than any public masturbation. How useful is it to draw a, quote, publicly masturbating five-year-old, end quote, into the same orbit as the boy described above, who sexually assaulted his cousin repeatedly over three years under procedures for harmful sexual behaviour. Perhaps this is why Nursing Times did not include this specific directive. However, the article did not voice any concerns about the consequences of pathologizing a very wide range of sexual behaviors or whether it was a sound decision to ask practitioners to draw children and families into complex bureaucratic procedures rather than use their experience and judgment to respond. In the wake of multiple inquiries and statutory guidance that focuses practitioners time on procedure and process rather than building trusting relationships with children one could ask who is being protected by such guidance, children or institutions. Meanwhile, disclosure rates and prosecution rates remain low. The most serious and prolonged sexual abuse of children by more powerful males continues behind the closed door of the family home. Thank you so much for listening.